continue our sermon series in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. You know, the reading of God's holy word. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That's why the reading of God's holy word, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Um, I'm wondering if you've ever been driving around and you have seen those, um, those bumper, stickers, bumper stickers that say coexist, and they have the various symbols of, of different uh, religious practices. And, um, and that's a sentiment that's been pretty strong in our nation. Uh, one of the things that is true about our nation is that we have freedom of religion, freedom of assembly. And uh, the truth of the matter is that we should defend that right for other peoples that aren't Christians. We should say that uh, anybody should be able to practice their faith and their religion. But that is different than saying that every faith in religion is equally valid. But that, has what, that is what our country has kind of developed into. It's what we call relig religious inclusivism. Um, in a 2011 Gallup poll, and it's probably even better, worse by now, 70% uh, of Americans uh, said they believe that all roads lead to God. All roads lead to God. And this kind of sentiment has um, uh, been heard in people like Mahatma Gandhi, who said, my position is that all great religions are fundamentally equal. Uh, rabbi Shmuley Botich, uh, a, a pretty prominent uh, Jewish rabbi, I'm absolutely against any religion that says one faith is superior to another. I don't see how that is anything different than spiritual racism. Or even Oprah, who said, one of the biggest mistakes humans make is to believe there's only one way. Actually, there are many diverse paths leading to God. So the truth of the matter is, if you're in this world, if you're walking amongst people out there in society and culture, you're going to bump into this view. That all religions and all spiritual practices, they're all just different paths to the same destination. But we have to ask ourselves is, is that what the Bible teaches? In fact, we have to ask ourselves, is that what Hinduism teaches? Or is that what Islam teaches? Because many people who say that there is only one way to God don't realize that most religions say that they are the only way to God. So there can't be this concept that all religions are equally valid. We have to deal with who is the authority. If we have a personal conviction that all religions are equally valid and they're all a pathway to God, what we're really saying is, I am the ultimate authority. I determine them. But if we have an authority that is outside of us, let's say the Word of God, 
then we have to ask ourselves, what does the Bible say? I'm a Christian, I follow Jesus. What does Jesus say about this? What we'll find is that very clearly, and not just only in our Scripture passage this morning, the Bible teaches us that there is power for salvation only in the name of Jesus. That there is an exclusionary element to the Christian faith. That there is a narrowness to the path of salvation. And that is in the name of Jesus. And we're going to look at that this morning. There is power for salvation only in the name of Jesus. The first point we have this morning is the disturbing message. Uh, the second point that we have is the question answered. And the third point we have is the alternatives denied. So let's go to that first point. I want to remind you that the way that we have ended up at this point in Acts chapter 4 is that following the time of Pentecost, when there was a great revival in the, in the, the city of Jerusalem and many people gave their uh, lives over to Jesus and became Christians, the church in Jerusalem is now just a baby. But it's not a small baby, it's a big baby. It's like 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 people strong. And they're gathering together and they're having uh, everything in common and they're believing in the Lord and they're listening to the teaching of the apostles and they're growing in their fellowship together. And during this time, many miracles were happening that were declaring the truth of the gospel, the truth of the testimony of the apostles. And one of these miracles is explained to us by Luke in this book of Acts. One of these miracles is that Peter and John were on the way in the hour of prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon to pray at the temple, to gather with the people of God and to pray at the temple. And as they're going into the temple, they see this crippled man sitting at the beautiful gate, a man that sat here many, many times before asking for donations. And at this time, the man looked at him and, and they said, look at us, we're going to give you something, but it's not money, it's not gold. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he was healed. And this man then follows them into the temple and everybody's seeing this guy that they knew has been crippled. He's always been crippled. And here he is jumping around and dancing. And it created an opportunity for Peter to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And so he begins to share his message. And then this is what results from that sharing of the gospel, that preaching. Verse 1. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. And in verse 2, my ESV translation says, greatly annoyed. But your NIV translation might say, greatly disturbed. Um, the, the concept here is that Peter and John are coming into conflict on what is the authority, right? Peter and John are presenting a message, and a, a, a particular kind of message, and it's confronting those who are in authority in the temple, confronting them, and it's making them just have to ask the question, who really is in charge here? Who really is the final authority in this endeavor? And so the disturbing message is what they heard the captain, the priest, the temple guard came upon them, greatly annoyed, and listen, this is what they're annoyed about. This is the thing that they are discerned about. Because they were teaching. You need to understand, the first thing that they were upset about is that Peter and John were teaching. This is Peter and John, who are simple fishermen. They did not go to rabbi school. They did not go to seminary. They are not of the priestly class. And they are teaching in the temple. That is an affront to, to these religious leaders. This is their ground. This is their place. They're the ones that are supposed to be teaching in this temple. So they're upset because they taught. And they're upset what they taught. Listen to what they taught. Teaching the people and proclaiming Jesus. And not just what they taught, but specifically what they taught. Teaching and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Now, I want to teach you something that my Sunday school teacher growing up taught me. And it's very important to remember this, okay? There were different classes 
of religious leaders at the time of Jesus. They were the Pharisees and they were the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees were the ones that were politically in charge of the temple. The Sadducees were a particular religious sect of the Jewish faith. They only believed in the inspiration of the first five books of the Old Testament, what we call the Torah. And so they didn't believe in any of the prophets that came after. They didn't believe in any of the Psalms and all these things that describe. They only believed in the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay, And so, because of this, they did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. And so... They didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead, and that's why they're sad, you see. You're going to remember it. They're sad, you see, because they don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. And so, of course, they're disturbed that not only are these simple folk teaching in the temple, and they're the ones who are the authority, they're not supposed to be teaching this. Not only are they upset because of what they're teaching, they're teaching about Jesus, but they're upset that they're teaching on the resurrection, which is something they don't believe in. They believe is wrong. They believe is not taught. So that's why they're disturbed. And they're disturbed so much. But look, look what happens. Arrested them, put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. So they, this is the first encounter of, of persecution of the early church. They are arrested for their convictions and beliefs and put in custody. They are put in jail for believing what they believe. And when I say that this sermon series is called Anti-Fragile Faith, this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about. Why did I call this sermon series Anti-Fragile Faith? Well, because a fragile faith would buckle under this kind of pressure from an authority that says, you're not allowed to do that. Oh, oh, okay. We won't do that. D don't worry. It won't happen again. Just don't put us in jail. Just don't put us in prison. But we don't see that, do we? But listen. Listen to this. Because it's very easy to hear the story about Peter healing this crippled man and then the opportunity to preach a message in Solomon's portico in the temple and think it's this sort of kind of small, intimate setting type thing. But what we find in verse 4 is that many of those who had heard the word believed in the number of men. Not to say anything about women being present at this. Came to about 5,000. 5,000 new converts from Peter's message here in this moment. 5,000 people who were regenerated by the Holy Spirit because of the preaching of the gospel. But there's a question that needs to be answered in this. It's not only the truth that there is power for salvation only in the name of Jesus, this exclusionary aspect to the Christian faith, but we can learn from the early church, we can learn from Peter and John, how exactly it is that we should respond to persecution. I'm not going to say that we're in the same place that Peter and John were, where they were under the threat of their own lives for sharing the gospel, where they were confronting the Jewish leaders of their time. Uh, most of the persecution that we experience, if you want to call it persecution, is maybe ridicule, maybe social isolation. And, and a lot of that we don't even sense in this area because we have a lot of the, the goodness of biblical values still alive in our community. But there's always a chance. There's always that reality that, that persecution could be in our future. It could be on the rise. And we have to be ready to figure out how we're going to face it if we encounter that. Well, look at what Peter and, and John did. They peacefully submitted to the persecution. We are not told that they sought to escape from their arrest, flee from their arrest. We are told that simply the religious leaders encountered them, did not like what they were doing, and they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day. And this is why one of the prominent sayings of the early church was, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Why did somebody say that? The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Because if you look at the scriptures, you'll find 
that persecution is actually good for the church. For Peter and John in this moment, it makes their great opportunity to preach in Solomon's portico in the temple turn into a jail ministry, which later then turns into a courtroom ministry. So you, you capitalize on these opportunities. You trust that God is in control, and you, and you realize that what God is doing here is He's providing more opportunities for you. So they submitted to the jail ministry, and, and they submitted to the courtroom ministry. And look at what God orchestrates in this. Verse 5. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. So, if Peter and John were sitting down one day and they said to themselves, you know, it would be really great, it would be really, really great if I could get an opportunity, if we could get an opportunity to share the gospel with all the prominent religious uh, Jewish people in Jerusalem. Wouldn't that be great? But I mean, how do you orchestrate that? You can't just call them up and say, I'd like to set up a meeting, right? So how's that going to happen? Well, God's like, don't worry about it. I'll do that. You just be faithful and share the good news of Jesus. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to gather them all together so they'll have to listen to you. And that's what happens, right? They all gather together. And when they had sat Peter and John in their midst, it's almost like you can, you can envision this. Peter and John are, are in the middle of them, and they all these religious leaders and prominent uh, societal and political figures of Jerusalem are surrounding them, and they're, they're going to ask them a question. That's an important question. They inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? You see here, right, the connection between name and power. The connection between name and authority. Right? For instance, if I were to show up at someone's property unannounced, and start looking around, and someone might come out and say, hey, what are you doing? I would say, I'm here in the name of the assessor of property, James Condra, looking at everything. Now, I'd be lying, but if I were to do that, I'm claiming an authority to do what I'm doing, right? On the basis of someone's name, someone's title. And here, these religious leaders who, they've got all the titles. They've got all the suffixes in their name. they got all the... The, the doctors and the uh, experts and the whatever, and they're looking at Peter and John, simple farmer or simple uh, fishermen from, from, from Galilee, and they're saying, and what authority do you have to do what you're doing? And whose name are you doing what you're doing? I'm the high priest. I'm the one who gives this authority, right? But here you are doing this. And then who, who, who's given you authority to do that? So listen to the other thing that happens in learning from the religious and, and learning from the early Christians and learning from Peter and John how you respond to persecution. You submit peacefully. And you're strengthened by the Holy Spirit. Listen to what Peter, we read about Peter in verse 8. Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Right? This is a different Peter, isn't it, guys? This is not the Peter that denied his Lord and Savior uh, three times. This is not the Peter who cowardly ran away when, when the armies came and, and took their, uh, their friend away in the dark. This is not their, the, that Peter. This is a different Peter. This is a Peter strengthened by the Holy Spirit. If we are to be under persecution, if we are to get arrested for the, the name of Jesus Christ and the, and the good news of, of the gospel, then we need to be praying, God, strengthen me by your Spirit. Give me the courage to share and to not buckle under this pressure. Give me the courage to have an anti-fragile faith, one that won't crack, won't break, no matter what comes, that I will be faithful to you. And what does Peter do then? Not only do they peacefully submit to arrest, not only do they entrust themselves to the Holy Spirit, strengthened by the Holy Spirit, but they boldly proclaim the gospel. He says, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, 
And by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. See, it would have been very easy for Peter to come up with some sort of politically correct answer in this moment, wouldn't it? It would have been very easy for Peter to, to say, all I did was say, God, the covenant God of the Old Testament, heal you, and it happened. And in some sense, he wouldn't even be wrong, right? Because Jesus is God. But instead, what he does is he boldly proclaims that this healing, the power and the name and the authority, it came from Jesus. That's why you're seeing this miracle here right now. That's why 5,000 men have given their faith, given their lives over to Jesus, because it's in the power of Jesus. Right? And then here in this moment, Peter could have done something else. Maybe he could have said, well, it was in Jesus' name, but, you know, Jesus is just an option amongst a plethora uh, of, of holy teachers who, who do these kinds of things. Jesus is just um, one option among many on the pathway to God. And, and so we're not trying to, to uh, compete with you. We're not trying to deny your authority. Uh, we're, we're just simply saying we're, 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 we're a new authority amongst a... Uh, a, a pantheon of authorities. We're a new option amongst, amongst many options. And each one is, is, is valid. And Peter could have done that, couldn't he? But listen to what he says instead. So the disturbing message, the question is answered. This is in the name of Jesus, the power of Jesus. And then the alternatives denied. Verse 11. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And Peter makes it so that there can be no denial. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among people by which we must be saved. This concept of the stone rejected is something that is drilled over and over again in the New Testament. It's a quotation. From Psalm 118. I want to trace this for you because I think it's important for us to understand why it is that maybe Peter would use this particular imagery, this particular passage, to explain to the Jewish leaders and rulers of his time that their time of being the authority, their time of being the path towards God is over. And that Jesus now has come and he is the Messiah. And if you want to have salvation, there is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. Psalm 118, verse 22 through 24 says this, The stone that the builders, builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Jesus actually takes this imagery up in the Gospels. I'm going to read to you. Matthew chapter 21. And this is enlightening, guys, because look at the way Jesus uses this to confront the religious leaders of his time. Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 through 46. He teaches them the parable of the tenants. Do you know what the parable of the tenants is? It's the one where he talks about this man who owns this land, and he rented it out to these people who are taking care of the land. And this is what, the, uh, what this parable says. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? And they said to him, 
he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. So Jesus gives this parable. And basically what he's talking about is Israel. He's saying, I'm talking about you. You are the, the vineyard is God's. You are the tenants. You're the religious leaders. The vineyard is Israel. You are the tenants. The vineyard is God's people. You are the tenants. God has given you authority over this vineyard. He's given you a position and a role of prominence as a religious leader. And what have you done with that? Well, when he sent you the prophets, what did you do with them? You beat them, you killed them, and you stoned them. And then he thought to himself, I'll send my son. They'll respect them. And so what did you do when I sent Jesus, my son? And here's Jesus telling this story. He's prophesying even his own death, right? But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And so they took Jesus outside of Jerusalem and they killed him. And so when, therefore, the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do? Well, they said, they said, they're going to put those wretches to a miserable death and give the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. And listen to what Jesus said in response to that. Have you never read in the scriptures, quote, Psalm 118, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. And what plays out in the book of Acts? Over and over again, the Jews reject the gospel of Jesus till finally Paul says, fine, then we turn to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles become, begin to flood into the church, believing in the good news of Jesus Christ. So Jesus used this particular image and prophecy to describe to the Jewish leaders of the time that their time for being the authority was over, that he was coming, and that if they did not uh, repent of the way that they were doing, that this stone, uh, people, he, they're going to fall on him and they are going to be crushed by him. Okay? But listen to how Peter applies this in the New Testament, not just here in the book of Acts. He says in 1 Peter chapter 2, in the letter that he wrote, something profound about this. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. So this is clearly all the way through the New Testament, this teaching that Jesus is the stone that the builders rejected, the stone that the religious leaders of his time rejected. Yet, he is the stone that is chosen as the chief cornerstone. He is the new authority. He is now the exclusive way to salvation. He is the name under heaven given among men by which men can be saved. He is not a name among other names. He is the name, the one and only name. And so my encouragement to you is that as you uh, confront in this culture and in this world this, this concept or this idea which I grant is, is, in some ways, seems nicer, right? You almost feel like you're being prideful or arrogant to say the only way to salvation is in Jesus Christ. But there are things that we can know. And that is one thing that we do know because God's Word teaches it to us. And this is not an opportunity for us to then slam other people who are in other religious faiths or practices because they don't know like we know. It's not an opportunity for us to be prideful or arrogant about the fact that we have the truth and others don't. It's an opportunity for us in humility to begin to pray that God would reveal to others the truth of his word, that Jesus 
is the name, the only name under heaven by which men can be saved so that we can shake ourselves from all idols and find true life in Him. See, we don't get upset when, when an air traffic controller is, is, is guiding an airplane to land on a very narrow strip called a runway. Because we understand that the runway is the place where you can land, where you'll be safe, where you, there's life, where you're not going to die, right? And what I'm saying is Jesus is the runway. And what we're trying to do is guide people to that runway. Because there is no other runway. That's the only runway. That's the only place where we can find salvation. There's power for salvation only in the name of Jesus. And I pray that you would know that in your own heart. And you would believe that and you would live out your life in, in, in connection with that truth, but you would also be convicted of that truth as you confront this concept of religious pluralism in our day and age um, in a graceful and kind way. Amen. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for all that you've done for us, Lord. We pray that we would know you. We pray that we would trust in the name of Jesus and no other name that we would teach others and lead others to that name so that they can be saved as well. And we ask all this in Jesus' most holy and precious name.